I've been told by everybody up on this roof that they're all off the roof. I am on the roof of Explosion 4. Got fire through the roof of the fire building in the entire rear section. Please, I was never given the payday. Has you been accounted for? Okay. 610B, now is the main date, 610B. I'm out uh, here, we got a fire. One and a half story, single family dwelling, fire shown from the second floor, give me a second alarm on this. See up there, the top floor, I got people hanging out the top floor windows with a baby. Commercial building, uh, a lot of fire, a lot of smoke, go ahead and strike a third alarm on my orders on this. We got people on the front fire escape here with windows sensors below them, we need somebody up there. Yeah, let them know we got a job. I'm pulling up now. Second alarm, I got a one-story single-family frame. Heavy fire showing from the attic. So we're using all hands. We got one line stretch, fire on the fourth floor. Second line being stretched. Primary searches are underway. Hey, everybody, and welcome to Old School. Um, Chief Rick Lasky. I'm with my buddy, Chief John Salka. And, um, John, we, we were just talking in the car. Um, we are doing our, our, our normal conversations uh one of them about tactics and strategy and you know everything else along those lines and and particularly with this show with with uh, we're talking old school or again worlds colliding but you and i did a show a while back that got a lot of great feedback and a lot of people asked us to do another one and kind of expanded a couple of things but that was uh we did that as the first line goes so to, so goes the fire that kind of thing uh the importance of of stretch that initial attack line and everything that accompanies that with the, with the fire attack. And I've, I've joked in class before, but kind of half jokingly about, you know, th that pumper has water and hose on it. Everything else afterwards on that thing is extra. You know, I know you need some tool, you need some air pack, stuff like that, but all the EMS stuff, all the, all the other things, it's just, you know, way back in the day that it was a pump. With, with, with a couple lines that you could draft water out of where you dug down to a water main. And then someone brought the hose tender and you connected hoses and you did everything else with the steam. So, you know, all that extra stuff is just that it's extra. Now, I know it's obviously necessary, the majority of what we do today, but the first line as a battalion chief, I've said this before, think about how many fires, John, that, that could have went a different direction, but it took them too damn long to stretch the initial attack line. They pulled off the back of the rig, you know... It, We've talked about training. We'll get to that in a second, but it's a big pile of, of, of spaghetti on the ground, all knotted up. And right, um, right. I mean, you, nothing's more important. And everybody who's listening, uh, if you are a firefighter in any in any size fire department anywhere, I don't care what you do, volunteer, part paid, part career, on call, full time, urban. I mean, obviously, the basic unit of service for the fire service is the engine. Some fire departments don't have anything but engines. We know that. And, and like you said, the, and the most important stuff on the engine is the water, the hose, and obviously the firefighters. Stretching hose and putting fires out. I was the captain of 48 engine in the Bronx. I was very fortunate to, uh, to be selected to, to work there for several years before I got promoted and moved on. Great company, doing 6,000 runs plus a year with a, with a great crew of firefighters that knew what they were doing, didn't need that much direction when it came to tactics. And, and time after time, job after job, I witnessed that we, the engine company, the first two engines, sometimes the second engine, but it was always the engine companies that made that made the turn on the fire. Now the fire is not the whole thing. Obviously, we want to put the fire out. We we mentioned on on some previous podcasts about trucks going in and making searches and saving people, and those are all priorities as well. But when you get right down to it, I remember being the captain. I remember walking in the firehouse and walking through the apparatus floor, of forty eight engine, and looking at and looking at the back hose belt. I always took I always took a lap around the rig every every day or night that I came in, make sure everything looked okay, everything still was in order quick step up on the back step to see the nozzles and the hose and, and, the, and the donut rolls and everything else that we had there. A lot, a lot of different aspects of, of hose operations. And it was always very important. And then, and then jump ahead a couple of years to me being a battalion chief, fortunately for me, in, in the same neighborhood, in the same part of the Bronx. And I can tell you, I never transmitted a second alarm because the third truck didn't show up. I never transmitted a second alarm because the second two trucks uh, aerial was malfunctioning and they couldn't get it up. But I transmitted second alarms when, when, when a supply line burst and also our, our, our primary source of water was interrupted at a job. Or when the third two engine couldn't get in the block and I, and I, and I couldn't get a line on, on the threatened exposure. So, you know, water and, and, and hose and, and the extinguishing capability of the typical engine company is vital, vital, vital. Very important to, to, to our, the work that we do as, as the fire department. And to be able to stretch that line, you know, you and I are big into the YouTube videos, Facebook, and all stuff, just watch it, learning. We've said it before, as long as we've been on the job, both of us, we learn stuff every day about the, about the, about this job. And some of the videos that are out there are pretty incredible. 
Um, and, and both of us are very cautious to not become the uh, sidewalk armchair critics out there because it could be your department, could be your people. However, we've asked this question in class a bunch of times. How many people drive a pumper to the scene or have driven a pumper to the scene of a, let's just call it a house fire? All the hands. Okay, when you pull up, as you pull up, what's the first thing you do? Set the parking right. What's the next thing you do? Throw the pump switch. What's the next thing you do? Put it in gear. What's the next thing if you're safety conscious, what do you do? Well, I get out, I put, I chalk the wheel. Then what do you do? Well, depending on what part of the country, either prime, not prime, and you're waiting then for what? I'm waiting for somebody to say, yell, holler, get on the radio, give me hand signals, smoke signals, whatever, saying start water, charge a line, whatever. And yet we watch the videos and you see, you know, the firefighters got the line stretched, you know, clear, good, no, not knotted up, really good stretch, waiting, 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 waiting. And the drivers run around and trying to drag five inches this way and all this. And they brought a whole tank full of water. It was 500 or 750 or in some cases even more. Let's just say 500 or 750. And this place is roaring. they got good couple rooms going. And, and you're sitting there going, all right, eventually he's going to charge a line. Eventually he's going to charge a line. Come on, guys. You, you at least... You know, Lisa gets some, nothing's going to change until we start flowing water, right. until we put water on a fire. And that is a little bit of frustra- frustrating. But, 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 but i got to interrupt you a second because it's not always the engineer or the chauffeur. You know, I've I watched videos and you've watched them with me. I've even watched videos and then either texted to you, or texted them to you, or I told you to take a look at it. And sometimes you just see the engine pull up and it's, a, it's an obvious working fire, maybe even rocking and rolling. And everybody is sort of just walking around. Nobody's even really hustling, and that includes the firefighters that were in the back. Now, I'm, we're, we're not here being critical of any department or any rank or anything like that, but you know, you, you got to put you got to put a bounce in your step, man. You got to get those lines pulled. Obviously, your officer has to give the order. You know, there's got to be some direction there, some structure. We understand that, but obviously, we pull up to a fire. You pull up on an engine. We, you got your work cut out for you. You're going to pull a hose. You're going to pull a line, or you're going to get water in that fire as quickly as you can somehow. So, getting a like I said, getting a spring in your step or getting a jump in your step or getting things underway as quickly as possible is vital, vital, vital to the work of an engine company. Well, and there's been some videos out there that I've I've shared, you know, and I'll mention a couple of departments, Stockton, California, um, St. Louis, um, and um, Baltimore County. And I, I know everybody's got good and bad in their department, but, oh, my God, these videos, you want to talk about good, quick, aggressive Fast-moving, trained firefighters. Right. You can't be good at this stuff. We'll talk about, tra- about training. It, yeah, it doesn't happen. And you watch these videos, and you watch the guys from Stockton. They pull up, helmet cams going. You a whole. It's like God. I wish I was at that fire. I, know. I mean, I know. the line comes off. The 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 officer does his three sixty. The doors forced. This is going on. The next thing you know, they're flowing water. Or you watch these guys hustle down the street, and and you see that John, like you said, you know, not the slow. Well, you were just here, you know. Uh, sometimes I think that's a little bit of nervousness on because uh, due, due to inexperience because good experienced firefighters don't like lay down or take their time they move they right. move quick on, right. and they move quick right. on the fire. Do you remember recently I, I saw a I, I think it was a YouTube video somewhere I think it might have been off of YouTube but it was on Facebook doesn't really matter I'm not doing commercials for either one of them um, but it was, but it was a company that pulled up and it was just man you got to watch this so I click on it and I'm watching. And this engine pulls up to this big, beautiful home. It almost looked like a Queen Anne with the wraparound porch. Fire was out a couple of the front windows under the front porch. Hence, the fire had was was burning merrily under the under the canopy, under the roof of the front porch, all the way around. And I started timing it, and I'm thinking, "Oh my God, this this looks like it's going to be you know long." And all of a sudden, boom, boom! There were two lines operating from the front lawn, knocking down the. I, I can't remember. You and I talked about it, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And, and it came up in our conversation. We saw who it was. And I was just so thrilled and so happy. I said, it was under a minute. It was under a minute. They had not one, but two lines off the rig, two lines charged, and two lines working, putting fire out in under a minute from the time that the wheel stopped turning. And, you know, there's a tactic of, of being able to get stuff underway, get getting operations underway and water flowing in under a certain amount of time. You know, we know we, gosh, we, we time ourselves on, on putting PPE on and face, face pieces and SCBAs and the ZFPA standards on all that. Gosh, there should be an NFPA standing on, on water on a fire. It shouldn't be there from the time the wheel stopped till the time that the, the, no, the house And, and we've got the minimum company standards. And I mentioned just three fire departments that, that I use as examples. You know, Stockton, St. Louis, and Baltimore County, they do a, the videos were like freaking incredible. They were so good. But it doesn't have to be big metro departments, John. You know, Louisville's no. a couple hundred guys with eight stations. You've been down there. Louisville, Texas, they, they beat the crap out of fires, man. They get off the rig, water, you know, it's like. 
nozzles a blazing. You know what I'm saying? They are throwing water, doing what they got to do. You know, Fort Worth does a good job. There's a lot of Lions, Illinois. Our buddy Gordon Ort, single station department. You watch the fires from there. You know, single station pulling up, mutual aid coming, but they kick ass. And this is all due to. I was just going to ask you, why does it happen? Why? Tell me. It, it, well, first of all, I, I, there's two ways I describe that. One, it's all down to who's running the company. Two is training. It's tra- now. The reason I say running a company or running a department, whatever your scenario is, is because with lazy ass officers, with lazy ass company officers that don't want to train, don't want to stretch hose, whatever, that stuff don't happen. And and now you're you're hoping your firefighters are doing it on their own, all right? But it's training. It's tra- you know you stretch lines, you stretch lines, you stretch lines. I told you that story. I'm following back one of my captains in Trophy Club when I was interim chief there. Come back from a smoke in the house call. And we're talking like eleven thousand square foot home. Some of these places, right? We're coming back. To, to quarters, and the, they're about a block ahead of me. I see the engine pull over real quick to one of the city parks. And I see one of the guys jump out of the jump seat, his gear, and he grabs a cross lane, pulls it, boom, and he's flaking hose, and off he goes through the park. And I'm calling him. I'm going, I'm asking Shane, what, what do you got? And as I get close, he's doing the, the hand across the throat, like, and I go, what do you, he goes, nothing, nothing. He goes, we're just stretching hose. He goes, I told Kalo that, that the jungle gym sets on fire. Which means he has to stretch a hose through this front gate, around the around the merry-go-round, okay, past the teeter-totter, past those springing ass things that the kids ride to get to. You don't have to have a training field. You, you all you need is hose, and firefighters. People, you can stretch hose anytime you want. And the and I I used to love the fact we talk about pride, and about, you know, pride is about it's it's about a, it's not about wanting to be better. Than someone else who want to be better than your, than where you're at yourself, you right. yourself, and you, and I used to love the fact that one of my I won't say which one one of my firehouses didn't think they knew on that particular shift they were faster at stretching a line into a burning building than another one. And I asked people in class who said how'd they get that way? They got that way because they stretch hose, they stretch hose, they stretch hose, they stretch hose. They train, they train, they train. You and I have been places where the only time the cross leg comes off the hose is once a year for hose testing. You know, it, it, I mean, and folds. you told me a story one time about when they pulled oh. some hose off and a soda can came off in a branch, and you were like, "Gee, where'd those come from?" And he said, "Ah, we, we did the homecoming party with the with the homecoming parade with the rig, the football team." You said that was three months ago. You, this this hose hasn't been off in three months. Three you months, know? right? Was, yeah, it was February, and homecoming's like September, October. I'm like, you haven't right, seriously? You haven't stretched the hose? Well, you and I have buddies in Detroit that run fires all the freaking time. And their hose is on the rig, packed better, comes off quicker than places that only do it for for hose. And there and there's the reason why, is because they train. Some departments are busy, but but I know departments that that don't run fires, and don't train, and don't train. But I know some departments that don't run any fires, John, and they're just as fast, right. and they're just as efficient, and they're just because again, we're not talking about being unsafe. We're talking about speed comes with efficiency. Efficiency comes with training. That comes with muscle memory, being able to stretch the hose. Let me ask you. And, and, let, let me tell you. Go ahead. And being a chief of a small volunteer fire department, just a small group of men we have there, and we and we don't do a lot of fires. We're, we're in a very stable, nice suburban neighborhood, and there's just not a lot of house fires there, or or anything else for that matter. Um, we do a lot of running, a lot of extrications, a lot of emergencies, a lot of you know. But anyway, and we get a lot of young guys that just they're hungry. They're hungry to stretch. They're hungry to work. They're hungry to play. They're hungry to do the job. And I'll tell you what, they love drill night, they love stretching hose, we stretch hose, we charge it, we set up obstacles, just obstacles around the firehouse. Go around the pumper, stretch out the back door, come around that telephone pole, and then through the parked cars, and then call for water when you get here. Let's see how long it takes you. We'll set up two or three, two or three person teams. And tell me. And I'm telling you, that they, and it gets better and better. And as tell me on. about the next time you catch a job, and they do it, and it goes just as quick, just as fast. Right. They come back. They're bouncing in High their five boots. Each other, yes. which, of course, we don't want them to do in front of the fire building. But the point is, th- that's what training is all about. And training, you know, gosh, the word itself just doesn't doesn't elicit the proper response. The word training just almost lulls everybody, but it shouldn't. When you say the word training, your people, your firefighters should be thinking, wow, the last time we did, or, or remember what we did last week, Cap, or remember what we did la- last, last week, Lieutenant or Chief? And uh, like I said, when I was a captain of 48 Inches, my, my, my greatest... Stories and my greatest examples are there because number one, I was I was a captain of an engine company, which was great. I had a great crew, I had great firefighters, great company officers working the other shifts. And if your people know what they're doing, if your people are solid, if they're solid in their tactics and their attitude and everything else, obviously you still need to be trained. Obviously things still need to be maintained. 
and, and sharpened all the time. But And I love the story. I was a new captain of 48 Engine. We're talking a long time ago now. And uh, out the door we went one afternoon. The truck was not in quarters. They were already out somewhere. They ended up getting to the fire first. And, and 56 truck transmitted a 1075, which was a working fire and on a store. It was a storefront fire on uh, uh, one, one of the main avenues there. And uh, we, we, we left quarters. It was only a few blocks away. We got there very quickly. And when we get there, I look up the block. I see this job. It's a good job. And we pull over to the curb. My, my MPO, my chauffeur, jumps out, starts to test the hydrant. I jump out of the rig. Of course, the engine also doesn't go to the back step and pull hose or point it out or anything. I start walking towards the building. I took about 10 steps, and I realized, oh, I'm new here. I think to myself, I'm new here. Let me make sure they're stretching what? Two and a half. FDMY rules for commercial buildings, two and a half, especially a good working fire like that. So I stop, mid-stride, stop. I spin, do a 180, and I start walking back. Boom. I bang right into Dominic Libinati, the nozzle man. Dominic, when he, I look at him, over his arm is the dry holes folded, two and a half inch hose, over his arm at the nozzle. I bang right into him. I said, Dominic, he said, what are you doing, Cap? I said, oh, I, I, I he said, you, you turned around to see if we get two and a half, right? You want to make sure we get the right hose? I said, no, 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 I just want it. He said, yes, you did. Yes, you did. <laughs> and we do. And you know, it's a funny story because they did know what they were doing. And I was a little unsure of them because I was brand new there. But, but they, they proved to me that training works, that competency and, and firefighters that know their job and love what they're doing, they make the difference. You see, what if they didn't have two and a half? What if I said, Billy, come on, you're, I know you're a probie, but we need two and a half. This is a commercial building. Okay, Cap, they dump it, they run back. Now we got the delayed line. So, you know, the fast lines, the fast water, the quick fire knockdown happens because officers that pay attention to training and firefighters that are trained and, and remember their training. Exactly, and that's a reflection on who this guy worked for. It's a reflection on everybody, yeah. on the officers, on the chiefs that are mandating the officers to train, on the firefighters that aren't just sitting there chewing their gum, tapping a pencil while the captain's teaching them. They're really paying attention and jumping in on it as well themselves. You know. Well, and out of the hundreds of things we do in the fire service to be good at what we do, you know, there, there's, there's some that range right at the top of the list, and if not at the top when it comes to fighting fires. In fact, in my world, at the very top is stretching the hose line. So let's talk about just technical stuff really quick. Tactical stuff. So uh, hose line, you're gonna, whether you get a pre-connect, whether you have a dead load off the back. And, and, and one of these days we'll talk about dead loads and the advantages of that. But let's just go with the size of a hose. You're stretching hose line into a house fire, a single, a single family dwelling. Stretching hose into a house fire. What are we stretching? What dimension? What dimension hose? What size? Well, for, for a house fire, we're yeah. talking an inch and three-quarter. Right, inch and three-quarter. I guess there's got a few people out there maybe still dragging an inch and a half around, but we're talking about the small line. We're talking about inch and three-quarter. It's, it's the small line. It's 175, 185, 195, you know, in that ballpark of gallons per minute, and that's adequate for the fire load in a typical private dwelling, in a typical house fire. Now, what's interesting is people look at the Bronx and they see a six-story tenement and think, oh, there's a bigger building. That must be a bigger hose. And the answer is, bam, No. It's still residential. It's still couches, chairs, living rooms, bedrooms, hallways, but it's a taller building. So we're still going to stretch inch and three quarter in. It might be a longer line than a pre-connect. We don't have pre-connects in the FDNY, but but so we can safely say residential is almost always, very frequently, inch and three quarter. FDNY has a rule. Everybody doesn't have a rule, but you certainly should be looking at what for commercial building fires, storefronts, and things of that nature. That's when we jump up to a two and a half, right now. That's old school. Old school is inch and three quarter or inch and a half and two and a half, but time has moved on now, and now we have what in between those two? Well, we've got two inch. Right. You know, and you should be dragging a three inch around, but we have two inch. And, you know, and, and a lot of people, John, a lot of departments that do the inch and three quarter and the two and a half, they call them the, uh, what are they, the residential line and the commercial line to right. help their firefighters. And, I don't know, have a problem with that. I don't, don't have a problem because it's either. answering the question. Yeah. What what place do you use it for? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. The versatility of the industry quarter when you're trying to get in, get after it versus big building, wide open spaces a lot of times need more GPM. Because we talked about this before. GPM puts out fires, which brings up something you and I talk about when it comes to training. We're sitting around the kitchen table, a lot of firehouses, and we'll say, so what do you guys, you know, have to look at their pumper and you go, Okay, so what do you have in your cross say? Oh, that one's 200, this one's 150, or whatever. Okay, so those two are 200, this one's 150. What kind of nozzles do you have on there? Uh, bop, 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 bop. Okay, what do you flow? A question mark on the face. And all of a sudden, one you know, and one may know, and the rest of them are kind of, and they, they start looking, and I'm like, is, you know, I mean, wouldn't you think that's kind of important to know what do you have coming out of the hose? 
right. just to know how much water you've got coming, how much what do you got coming out per minute, you know, just just to know, you know, I, I kind of want to know how much I'm flowing. And there's no, and this is not a scientific question. There's no absolute answer. There's not even an absolute range. It varies dramatically. But we're still looking. We're not talking ninety gallons per minute for an issue three quarter hose line. Is that going to put a room a fire out? Yeah. Yeah, you know, you can stretch a, a hose line into a house fire and use 90 or 100 gallons a minute, and it's probably going to work. It's not going to work well. It's not going to work for every condition, for every size room, for every size house. You talked about 11,000 square foot houses. But, but some of the accepted numbers are, and I like to tell guys stuff that's easy to remember because I'm, I'm a pretty simple guy. And I always say inch and three-quarter. Inch and three-quarter hose, if you listed it as a decimal point, would be 1.75. And there it is, 1.75. 175 gallons a minute. You can go up from there. 10, 20, 30 gallons a minute if you want. You can squeeze more out of it. And the same thing for two and a half. Two and a half, written as a decimal point, is 2.50, 250. Those, those are just ballpark numbers, but they're numbers that are easy to remember. And, and, you should, and that's why we stretch two and a half for commercial buildings. Why? The fire load is heavier. There's more flammable stuff. Shoe stores, hardware stores, things of that nature are more are stocked you know, to the floor, to the ceiling with flammable material. And you want to get a little bit more flow. And, and hopefully, along with some pressure, a little bit more reach. Absolutely. And again, you know, these are the these, these are things you can sit around the kitchen table and talk about. These are things on drill night you can sit down. You know, you don't have to be out there necessarily doing stuff. You can be on the back step on the apparatus floor without driving out the door. That's, That's right. right. We talked about the importance of stretching hose and, and, and leading out and, and drilling and practicing and getting better and better and better and more efficient. But there's some great conversations you can have, just like we're having right now, about stretching that line, about getting enough water there, about getting it inside. You know, just the whole point of getting it off of the rig into the building where the fire is at is huge. So. And, and there's a couple of things you really got to know. We're not going to go much longer here, but uh, and we have a lot more to talk about. We're going to have some future episodes coming up talking about hose and, and, and hose beds and things of that nature. But there's a couple of things you need to know all the time, and, and Rick already mentioned them. One of them is... You're riding on an engine today, and, and frankly, if, if you're in a building where there's an engine, you should know this, whether you're riding on the engine or not. You know, how many pre-connects do you have? Obviously, pretty easy. You can look at the rig and see that. But how many lengths, how long, how many feet, how many lengths of hose do you have in each one of them? Some people have two or three of the same length. Some people have a, a long one and a short one and a medium one. And I don't know what you have or why you have it. And there's advantages to all of them, but you should know that. You should know the longest pre-connect we have is 250 feet. You should know that if that's what it is, or 200, because when you pull up and you're getting ready to grab one to pull to a house, you should know which one to pull. There's other questions that are important as well. Is you know, if it's a first floor fire in a two story house, or a first floor fire in a two and a half story house, and you have two or three pre connects, you might not take the longest one just to make sure you reach it. You might take the shortest one, knowing you'll reach it, and also knowing you're leaving the longer one for what? Maybe to go to the floor above, which may require some more hose. So it's not quite as simple as just grabbing a longest one to make sure you get there, but there's something you should know. You should know what size pre-connects you have, and you should know what kind of nozzles you're operating with, and you certainly should know the length of every pre-connected hose. You want to be successful, train, train, train. You want to be successful fighting fires, stretch the hose, stretch the hose, stretch the hose. Know the things that John just talked about. Be good. Be proud of the fact that, you know what, I, I think we're a lot better than so-and-so or so-and-so. You, know, you don't have to be nasty about it, but, you know, there's nothing wrong with going, I'm pretty confident. I, You know, we train all the time on a lot of things, but especially on stretching holes off our pumper into the buildings. Yeah, I, I did 33 years with the FDNY, and I don't know too many engine companies on my job that didn't think they were the best. Yeah. Now, it can't be true. They can't <laughs> all be the best, but they all thought they were the best, and they all acted like they were the best, and they, and they all performed very well. And I'm sure that's true in lots and lots of places. Well, it is. Well, hey, folks, thanks for joining us for another one of our, our episodes of Old School. Uh, I'm Chief Rick Lasky, and I'm here with my buddy. John Salka. John Salka. If you want to get hold of John, you can get hold of John at what's your email? Chief John Salka at gmail.com. And I'm Chief, I'm, uh, Chief Rick Lasky. I'm Chief Lasky at gmail.com. Or you can get us on Facebook or Twitter. We're on all the different social media, uh, you know, deals. So um, with that... Uh, we hope you you hope you got some out of this. If you have any questions, you know, shoot them to us, uh, you know, on Facebook or Twitter or whatever, or give us, you know, shoot us an email, and we'll look to take care of you. Um, till till our till our next show, uh, we we end all of our shows with with one phrase that's very important, and that's please keep all the men and women in the armed forces in your thoughts and prayers, so we can sleep very very sound and safe tonight. And never forgetting means never forgetting. Be safe, folks. Thank you, and God bless you.